Welcome to another edition of RCE. Again, your host, Brock Palin. And you can find me on Twitter at Brock Palin, all one word. And you can find the show online where you can find all the back shows at www rce cast.com and also there was an issue with the itunes feed where a bunch of shows were missing that is now fixed so those of you who are looking in the itunes catalog and it looked like we hadn't updated a show in a long time uh they should all be populated now yeah um, we're gonna blame that on the the rce gremlins they, <laughs> they appear every once in a while but this one this one was definitely their fault Yep, and that is my co-host Jeff Squires from Cisco Systems and also one of the authors of OpenMPI. So Jeff, thanks again for taking some time out of your busy day. Sure, and i got to throw in the obligatory ping from my blog out there. Get to it from the RCE webcast. It's on blogs.cisco.com, and I just write about uh, general MPI, HPC, networking kinds of things. So please feel free to drop by and and, uh, send me your thoughts. So, okay. Brock, what are we doing today? Uh, today we're talking about XDMF. Um, it's kind of like a file format, but it uses a uh, guest we've had on here before for actually storing a lot of the data. So I need some clarification of exactly what this is. So I'll go ahead and introduce our guest instead of, try- instead of uh, uh, hacking up exactly what it is. Uh, our guest today is Jerry Clark, who is from Army Research Laboratory, and they were kind enough to... You know, let him speak with us about this. So, Jerry, why don't you take a minute to introduce yourself and give us your background? Okay, sure. Hey, Jeff Brock. Um, my name is Jerry Clark. Um, I'm from the Army Research Laboratory. I work in a um, computational science uh, and engineering branch. Um, and what we do, I don't know if you know a lot about the Army Research Laboratory, but it's the cutting edge of a lot of uh, basic and applied research and you know, to help the soldiers is what we're really after. Um, and we do a lot of analysis and design, which is uh, inherently uh, multidisciplinary. Um, so we do a lot of things like uh, computational structure mechanics, fluid mechanics, you know, multi-scale physics types of things. Um, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to avoid um, the stovepipes that regularly occur, and not only in those disciplines, but in, in codes in specific. In other words, a single code may have, it may have its own preprocessor, its own visualization system. Uh, and it just got ridiculous after a while. So what we're looking for um, was initially just a common data model and format that we could use for uh, visualization and pre-processing over uh, multi-disciplines. So um, we didn't find anything that perfectly suited us out there, uh, so we decided to develop our own. And what we came up with, it's called the uh, Extensible Data Model and Format, um, XDMF. I guess it could have been uh, e- EDMF, but EDMF didn't sound right. So we went with XDMF, and it's uh, it's, it's it's a lot of different layers. On the, I guess it's like uh, you know Shrek said, it's like an onion. A lot of different layers. On the top layer, it's just a common data model and format. Uses uh, HDF5 and XML, and if you use that, you can pull it into a lot of visualization packages, and uh, and you're off from there. If you want to go further into it, you can use it to uh, couple codes and do a lot of other things. The interesting thing about XDMF is. Uh, Kitware is involved with this somehow, who we've had on this show before. What exactly is the relationship between you guys and Kitware? We have a very long history uh, with Kitware. We were uh, involved in um, in Paraview uh, from the very beginning, um, and it, and that came that developed from our uh, our interest in uh, VTK in general. Um, so as 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 XDMF uh, was developed. Uh, Sort of the, one of the first things we needed was a reader in Paraview, uh, so we worked with them there, and they kind of got a little more interested in XDMF and helped contribute and helped uh, get the word out there a little bit for the types of things that could be used for, and it just sort of uh, snowballed and rolled from there. Cool. So let me let me uh, go in on on part of what you said earlier. You said none of the existing systems out there did what you need, and so you went and rolled your own. So what kind of features were you looking for that that others don't support? So what are the unique attributes of XDMF? Well, we needed something that was uh, uh, platform inde- independent. Um, and we had used HDF before, and a lot of the systems that were in development at that time, um, uh, I'm thinking particularly of um, DOE's uh, SAFE and uh, HDF EOS, they were using HDF as well. So HDF was pretty much the, uh, the, the way to go, it seemed, um, for a cross-platform uh, data format. But then to describe the data model, you know, what types of things are in there, you know, what, what is my topology, what are the names of my scalars, and things like that, um, there, 
there were a lot of uh, very complicated systems. We wanted something, I guess, more would be described as a data catalog than a data model and format if you're a purist about it. But we needed something uh, easy to do to easy things. Um, and we came up, and that's why we came up with XDMF. We use XML because it's easy to parse. Um, it's, it's easy to uh, dig down into the guts of it and, see, and you know, see what's going on. Um, and we use HDF5 because it, it gives us cross-platform uh, uh, platform independence, and it gives us uh, good high performance in um, both uh, scalar and parallel applications. All right, great. So that, that actually leads straight into my next question. What kind of platforms do you run on? And I was going to say, do you run serial and parallel, but uh, apparently you do. Could you give any insight on that? Uh, yes. We, um, like I said, it was, the, the first part was make it easy to do easy things. Um, so we attack, you know, uh, serial machines. Um, at the time, a lot of, you know, a lot of SGI, a lot of Sun. Um, at, at, right now, XEMF pretty much runs on everything, runs on Windows, runs on Macs. On the, um, on the parallel systems, uh, part of the uh, Army Research Laboratory has a uh, distributed shared resource center where we have, you know, uh, machines with thousands of cores, uh, parallel file systems, things like that. So XDMF has to run there for the types of codes uh, that we're interested in, uh, shocks, visits codes, um, multi-scale codes. So it is particularly designed uh, to work in those situations. Um, I was mentioning layers before. Um, a, a, an interesting part about that is uh, built into XDMF is a distributed shared memory system. So you can use this in your code to make it look like your code is writing to a, uh, a common data model and format at, at a file system, but it, what it's actually doing is writing into a distributed shared memory system. Not only does this allow you to do uh, runtime visualization on a code, but it also lets you uh, couple codes uh, from, a global, from a global perspective, as in each parallel code does not have to be cognizant of the decomposition of the other code, which uh, gives us a lot of interesting capabilities. Well, that is kind of cool. So do you, uh, a natural follow on to this then is, um, you know, how do you foresee this scaling into the, the massively multi-core kinds of environments? Because one of the issues that server vendors like myself are looking into is, you know, how do we, uh, you know, accommodate the changing landscape of having a whole pile of cores inside one box rather than what customers have typically been doing in the past is buying lots of systems to get lots of processors. Now it's all in one box. Does your system kind of accommodate the, the change in communication architecture that's going to be required to do you know, shared memory kinds of communication and, and NUMA kinds of communication rather than network-based kind of communication? Or even more complicated, you know, the, the combination of both, the new NA, so to speak, non-uniform network architecture in the box and and out of the box. That was a long question. <laughs> that was a long question. Um, <laughs> as luck would have it, um, part, of, uh, part of my branch is also looking into um, ad, what we call it advanced computing for tactical situations. Uh, and that involves a lot of looking at uh, FPGAs um, and cell processors. Where we're re really concentrated on there. We're getting a lot of speed up with uh, GPU um, calculations. So uh, we, that's been going on for a couple of years, and we have a, a good experience uh, with that. So um, what we've used XDMF for is to use that distributed shared memory um, to couple both the multi-core uh, calculations and calculations on several different uh, GPUs. So we can use this distributed memory concept uh, to allow the GPUs you know, to, to do their thing, to uh, take care of their hierarchical memory, but all, and then right into the distributed shared memory system along with the, uh, the multi-core uh, systems as well, which lets you know there be one spot where you can grab the data, uh, where everybody can get to it, and it's all synced up. Um, so the DSM is smart enough to know that it, you know if if that section of distributed shared memory that is being handled by a core lives on that processor, you know obviously doesn't send a message. It's smart enough to do a a, a shared memory write. Um, but if it has to go off processor to get something that's smart enough to know, you know where the uh, where that piece of memory is, the the shared memory system itself, you know, is is byte addressable. The neat part about it is that we've developed an HDF5 driver that sits on top of that shared memory system. So your code itself can use the HDF5 API to write in the distributed shared memory system, as opposed to using you know puts and gets uh, into the system itself. What's, what's nice about that is it lets a lot of codes not have to be rewritten. 
because they all have some kind of file I.O. capability. And they can use that section of their code uh, to, you know, get and put uh, information into distributed shared memory system as if they were writing out to an HDFI file. So I have a, I have a question about X XDMF then. Well, I guess that's what we're talking about. We're talking about XDMF. So XDMF actually has code that comes with this. Some of the examples I was seeing of how to use it actually involved just writing your own XML file and writing directly to HDF5. So it was more like a, a description language that then you could write an Im implementation of to be able to understand. But there is an actual XDMF library I can build and link into my code and get this distributed shared memory functionality. Uh, yes, there is. Um, on, the, on the top level, if all you want to do is uh, use it for visualization, um, AL3D from uh, Livermore does this. They, they are writing out their HDF5 files, so they just had print statements that printed out XML. There is a uh, C++ class library that comes with uh, XDMF, um, and it's wrapped for uh, you know, scripting languages like Python, TickleTK. It's also wrapped for, for Java. So if you're using any of those languages, you can get direct access to it. All access to the distributed shared memory, to reading and writing, um, XDMF files is, is in there. So um, it, at, at that level, uh, you've, you've got a lot of functionality that, uh, at your fingertips. Um, we're also in the process of uh, writing a new um, uh, uh, XDMF access uh, C++ class library to uh, uh, take advantage of you know, more modern things like smart pointers and visitor patterns for writing out in parallel. Um, also, what the, uh, our, our new um, system will also allow you to do is to use XDMF for more of an internal uh, element database for HPC codes, um, for you know, finite element codes and things like that. So when you write data to XDMF, do you, is it pretty much always like structured grids or something like that, like you say, like this is a grid, or is it really freeform where you can describe anything? Um, it's, it's not all structured grids, so um, basically uh, in XDMF you have a, a computational domain. Domain is, is, is busted up into one or more grids. Each grid has a topology uh, and a geometry. Uh, those topologies can be structured, um, they can be unstructured. Um, unstructured in that you know, they can be uh, tetrahedra, hectahedra, tetrahedron, or they can be mixed um, topologies as well. So you have a concept of a, of a grid. Um, and you have a concept of attributes on that grid, which are either node-centered, cell-centered, edge-centered, and they can be, uh, you know, scalars, vectors, tensors, um, you know, all, 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 the, all the usual suspects. So it's, it's a way of writing out and reading back in um, both structured grids and unstructured grids and mixed apologies um, and a lot of information. It's, the concept is that it's part of the system is that it, is, um, it separates the heavy data from the light data. The heavy data is your um, gigabytes, terabytes of calculated values, you know, your uh, positions. Um, the light data is both your data about the data, what topology are we talking about, um, uh, what are the names of the scalars, but it can also be uh, um, small values. Let's say I had total energy on, on an entire grid. I could write it out there. So that's what we're considering light data, and that's the part that's in XML. So as an MPI guy myself, I, I have to ask the natural follow-up question. What, uh, what are you using as the communication infrastructure underneath? Are you using some middleware package like MPI or, or something else, or did you go native and write this stuff yourself? Uh, well, uh, back in the day, uh, we, we started out with sockets, um, and that, uh, that had some problems. So eventually we moved uh, totally to MPI. So the distributed shared memory system is uh, is written totally on uh, on MPI, and so the answer to your question is yes. As far as communications, that's what we're using MPI. Good, love to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> what what kind of systems uh, do you support? What kind of networks are, are you tied to? Any particular MPI implementation, or are you nice and MPI implementation agnostic, or how does that go? Uh, we were we were fairly um, uh, MPI agnostic until we got to the point with the distributed shared memory. Um, where we needed to be, um, where we needed to uh, be able to handle threads as well. So we had to be thread safe. So um, for the, if you're going to use a distributed shared memory system, part of it, um, you have to use a uh, thread, safe, thread safe version of uh, MPI. Other than that, um, we just use uh, pretty basic calls, and we don't take, it, we don't try to tie ourselves to a lot of uh, any advanced features that may or may not be in any implementation.
So uh, what's some of the most complex XDMF definitions that you've seen, like either lines of XML or combinations of different complex uh, formats described? XDMF is uh, totally hierarchical um, in that you can have, you know, uh, grids of grids of grids. Um, they can be uh, collections of grids as well. They can be collections uh, temporally uh, and or spatially. So probably the most complex one we've seen are, are calculations that are run on thousands of processors uh, for a, a, a large amount of time. One of the big work, workhorses, workhorse codes here uh, is something called CTH, uh, which is out of San Diego National Labs. Um, and if we write, if, if we run on the thousands of processors for you know hundreds or thousands of uh, iterations, you're generating a lot of data, and each one of each one of the processors could potentially you know, um, dump a data set for every iteration, and you have to collect them temporally and spatially uh, within the XML. So the nice part about it is you can have these collection files if you want to look at the whole data set and have either um, a pair view or insight or visit, uh, read those things in parallel. Uh, or if, you, if you're having a problem with a, a, a certain section of the grid or a certain group of nodes, you can look at those uh, individually. So it, it turns out that uh, the more complex it is, you can you can also use the XDMF and, and the visualization tools uh, for debugging purposes as well. So if you want to do parallel I/O with a uh, um, XDMF, do you actually have to describe how your data is chunked up uh, inside XDMF if you're doing uh, parallel I/O to a single HDF5 file? Um, and then conversely, does XDMF support the one file per process or one file per group of process? where you can describe the overarching data um, in a single XDMF file. That is uh, actually part of motivation for um, our, new, uh, our new implementation. Um, in, the, in the current in implementation where you know, the, the idea and the focus was to make it easy to do easy things, uh, the one file per process um, was pretty much the rule. And while there was uh, very generic ways to uh, read and traverse a, a, an, X, a, an XDMF file. Writing it out was uh, a free-for-all. You could, there's many different ways to write the same data out to uh, XDMF. So we're, in the new version, we're putting a lot of uh, convenience functions um, in there uh, that let you both write you know, one file per process or coalesce them uh, into groups to uh, reduce the number of, uh, of files you have out there, which can get problematic if you have you know, thousands or tens of thousands of files out there. Uh, and it also p supports the parallel uh, HDF5, where you have uh, one uh, HDF5 file, and you're re and you're relying on the HDF5 infrastructure to um, uh, to do your parallel I/O. Uh, originally, I, I should mention too that uh, originally the uh, XDMF supported on the heavy data side; it only supported uh, HDF5. Uh, we're trying to uh, abstract that a little bit now to let you have other, other different kinds of heavy data, um, one being a, a flat file, maybe a, a compressed file. Um, also, what we're supporting now is um, uh, an SQL uh, heavy data type. So your heavy data descriptor can just be an SQL statement that magic happens and goes, goes gets your heavy data out of a database. Whoa, that's cool. So, wow, that actually just spun me off in an entirely different question. I'm going to ask a different question than I thought I was going to ask then. So, if you're talking about going into SQL these days, are you talking? Uh, are you even envisioning going into uh, cloud kinds of things, like say using Amazon's cloud or other people's clouds to do computations and/or data storage and retrieval, or is that kind of a different? You're sort, thing? Of, you're sort of reading my mind. You must. You're, you're like psychotic. I mean, psychic. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> um, we're uh, 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 again on. Um, well, uh, one of the things, uh, another thing our branch is uh, involved in is what's called mobile network modeling, uh, and we're trying to mobile uh, model uh, tactical networks uh, out on the battlefield. Um, we started using, and, and, and this effort started probably about a year or two ago, um, and you know, XDMF was built for physics-based modeling and simulations, and it, and it didn't have some of the things uh, that we needed for mobile network modeling, uh, in particular the idea of like a, like a packet of data or uh, things you need for uh, this, uh, parallel discrete event simulators, uh, like a, an event that happened. Um, so we are adding um, some things onto XDMF, and, and we're using XDMF as the basis and adding and creating a, a new data model and format uh, to handle these types of uh, data as, as well. So uh, 
part of that will be exactly what you're what you're mentioning, um, going out into the cloud. Uh, Part of the, the motivation for putting the uh, SQL heavy data type in there is because a lot of this data resides in, in database as, it, as it's collected. So we needed some way down the, in, in the bowels of XDMF to get hold of, of those types of uh, SQL data. So we are looking at, um, for this mobile network modeling, uh, doing you know, multi-tiered uh, uh, applications, cloud type applications, um, where we can both monitor and uh, monitor uh, simulations, emulations, and experimentation of mobile network uh, modeling, uh, as well as replay events and do statistics and uh, get all the information we need out of there. So uh, cloud computing is uh, is big in our future, that's for sure. Well, I have to say I'm all for it for, for two reasons. Uh, actually, as a, as a server vendor, I, I, we, we all love the cloud computing buzzword in, in everybody's definitions, but I was also a signal officer in the Army for uh, 10 years, and so I am well familiar with the complexity of these uh, mobile networks. and so. Uh, the modeling stuff is, is 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 sorely needed. But anyway, that aside, um, could you give a little insight into what is um, – so you gave a description earlier of, of, of heavy data versus light data. What What is the degree of complexity in in the difference of writing, say, a driver for the light data versus a driver for the heavy data? Uh, the uh, – we had uh, – a driver for the, for the, for the light data, um, you know, typically we're uh, – we had – almost exclusively uh, used XML. Um, in our new uh, implementation, we're also going to have a, a light data driver for JSON. And so, you know, we're doing, we're going more towards the cloud and we find that that's, uh, that's going to be very useful for us, a lot easier to, a lot faster to parse. Um, the heavy data uh, drivers, uh, we, it, it's fairly, it's fairly abstracted. So you, you, on the, on the upper levels. So, um, you know, writing a, a different type of uh, heavy data um, uh, driver, uh, Really, only involves you know uh, over over overriding a few uh, class methods, so it's not uh, it's not too difficult. You know, it's only software. How tough could it be anyway? <laughs> I'm sorry. I just have to say I, I appreciate your sense of humor there. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's what all the hardware guys tell me in Cisco. That's like, right. Oh, that's right. Great stuff. How come you guys don't use it? Oh, okay. <laughs> So let me go off in a slightly different direction here. So what is ARL's goal in making this uh, open source? It seems like this is a, you know, a critical piece of software that could be useful, you know, both tactically to, you know, our government's interests, but in giving it away, we also give that capability to others. So, you know, what is the, uh, what is the rationale for going open source? Well, the rationale for going open source, um, and um, it, it's really to be a, a multiplier. Um, what we're developing uh, internally is something called a computational science environment. Um, XDMF is, is at the center of that. Um, so what we're trying to do is provide to you know our researchers and our designers uh, a capability um, that is you know something they don't have, standing on the shoulders of giants of things that have already been developed. You know this computational science environment gives you things like parallel I/O and and um, uh, input parsers, and the world really does not need another input parser. So what we're trying to do is have our, our, our critical codes that are developed be developed on top of um, this computational science environment, which takes care of a lot of the plumbing and things for them. So by doing things like XDMF, um, what we get is we get a, a multiplier. First of all, we get features that we don't have time to develop or put in um, that are uh, added by uh, external external entities. For example, the uh, compressed tar file, um, the compressed tar file heavy data type was generated externally and just sent to us and we got code for free. You can't beat that. Um, what we're, since we're really after the computational science environment to provide to our researchers anything that can use XDMF, any extra tool out there that we can pull in and pull into our uh, analysis um, and then apply to specific problems that are army specific and, and and meant to, you know, what we're really after is help is, is helping the soldier. So by putting XDMF out there and letting a lot of tools, not not only letting it de get debugged, but also a lot of um, external tools that are out there be pulled in, uh, we get a huge multiplying factor um, that we could not, we could never uh, have funded all this uh, development internally. So. Uh 
I want to back up a little bit. Uh, something you said earlier uh, got my head spinning. Um, your ability to use like the the cloud and other things. This introduces an interesting idea. You could actually, as long as you had a public facing service and you had an XDMF driver, you could transfer terabytes of data to somebody through email because you would just send them the XDMF file that describes the data and where to download the data. And when you actually went to read it, then it would download it. Is this anything that like is handy or is thought about before or is this considered impractical because of WAN speeds? No, you know, every once in a while, uh, even a blind hog finds an acorn. And, you know, by going with XML and having the data described in XML, the, the, the shape of the data, the shape um, and, and location of the data described in XML, you know, not only through email, but a lot of low-end tools can go parse the data without ever touching the heavy data. So they can figure out, you know, how much storage do I need? How much bandwidth do I need? Is this even possible? They can go get parts of the data. Um, so by describing the, um, the, the type and the shape of the data in XML, as well as in the heavy data, it, it opened up a lot of things for us. I'd like to say we thought of that in the beginning of the development process, but we didn't. We just came upon it. So I guess uh, <laughs> things are the way they are because they got that way. That's interesting because there's something coming up. NIH has this open data mandate, and uh, NSF is looking at implementing a, a similar version where researchers need to make certain forms of raw data available uh, to other people. And what they could actually do is instead of having like a web portal, they could just have a service where you could just give these XDMF files and people could just run those and that automatically opens up the data from whatever remote resource they've made the data available on instead of having to have we, all these complicated systems and web interfaces and such. We mentioned the uh, we mentioned NetDMF before as, as a way to do it and that's exactly how uh, we're using it in the cloud. The um, a web service will give the XML, actually the JSON representation of the um, of the of the light data uh, down to a, uh, a JavaScript widget, and you you go through and you pick the events you're interested in, and hit go, and then it goes back and and, and gets the heavy data and can show you uh, um, uh, paths and communications on these mobile network models. So you're only getting you're only touching the piece of the heavy data that you that you're actually interested in, not all the gigabytes or terabytes that are there. That's neat. Now all we need to do is figure out how to kind of take the, the striped server transfer of grid FTP and apply it to this so that over next generation networks we can actually move, you know, 40 gigabits per second across, you know, four servers off of a parallel file system across the WAN to somewhere else. Yeah, you just need to buy bigger routers from Cisco. <laughs> Sorry, I had to do that. <laughs> Uh, so you mentioned that XDMF is, is a multiplier for ARL, that there are a lot of things in there that, uh, you know, ARL itself did not have the time or resources or funding or what have you to, to develop. And, and I have to say that's, that's kind of an echoed statement across a bunch of, of projects that we talked to, including my own. Um, so I wonder if you could talk to us about some of the things that, uh, you know, have been developed outside of, of say, the core group at ARL. And who else is involved in, uh, in the XDMF community and, and what have they done? Um, okay. A, a, some of the things that have been uh, developed outside that we would not probably have, have thought much about. Um, we're we're pretty much uh, we were pretty, when we started this project. We we're pretty much new to XML. So uh, being able to put out some kind of uh, XML DTD about uh, XDMF was was about as far as we could go. Um, some people down at the um, Federal University of Rio de Janeiro uh, actually came up and developed all the way on their own a uh, an XDMF schema. Um, which, uh, which was helpful in, in some of the things that they were doing uh, to view uh, XDMF files uh, that, were, that were, were sent to them to make sure that they were uh, valid and, 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 and worked well. Um, probably one of the more interesting uh, and, and potentially uh, productive uh, things that will come out of this is uh, some people, um, uh, John Bittescombe and uh, Jerome uh, Sumania at the uh, Swiss National Computer, Swiss Swiss National Supercomputer Center. Um, easy for me to say. Uh, took the uh, uh, the DSM uh, part of uh, XDMF and uh, sort of reworked it and souped it up and uh, are using it for um, some runtime visualization and and we're hopefully uh, we're 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 putting it together and it, it may turn out to be a a standalone uh, little. Uh, uh, functionality 
that we could build on, and our new um, our new XDMF uh, implementation can can take care of can take advantage of that. So you know, putting things out there in the open source, there is a uh, a huge advantage to it uh, for us as a multiplier. So uh, what's all your usual development environment look like? You an Emacs VI guy, or what do you use? Well, you know, I'm showing my age. Uh, I'm a VI guy. I tried to, uh, I tried to change. I tried to, I tried to be modern, but I, you know, found myself always going back to the uh, back to the colons, and uh, and messed up a lot of code trying to trying to go to other things. Uh, the new guys that are out there, you know, we 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 always get an influx of, of new people. In fact, we just opened up the crates and unpacked some new guys uh, a little while ago. You know, they're all into these uh, integrated dev development environments and and things like that. Um, they're not too impressed that uh, we can get uh, pretty far with uh, VI and printf. So, you know, they're, they're a totally different uh, environment. Um, part of our computational science environment is not just the uh, the software; it's also the 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 entire development environment. Um, so, we provide you know both the uh, um, the repositories, um, the hardware to to run them on, um, plus the uh, the automated testing uh, for things like either um, C test or Hudson uh, to automate automatically test our code uh, as we develop. And so um, we're trying to bring uh, you know a, a modern um, development environment uh, to uh, to a lot of the projects uh, that are around here, so they can take advantage of that through the computational science environment. So have these crazy young kids forced any of these uh, new source code repositories on you, like Git or Mercurial? Uh, we we went kicking and screaming. You know, CVS is all we ever needed. Um, but uh, some of these young whippersnappers, they forced us to go to Git. Uh, Got to admit, you know, every once in a while they get a good idea. So uh, <laughs> now we're we're totally we're totally using Git, and uh, as a as as a, a spin off of that. It turns out that uh, it's actually a pretty good system we're trying uh, to, to use to do our uh, remote dis uh, distribution to all our desktops. So, you know, instead of pushing everything, we can use a use a, a Git job to just pull it from a central repository and then only replace the parts that uh, is, as opposed to blowing down, you know, uh, tens of tens of gigabytes to every workstation every night. So they come up with a good idea every once in a while. So uh, what's the craziest use of XDMF you've ever seen? Something that you totally did not expect or just like, wow, that actually works. I'm impressed. I'd have to say it was with some of the, with some of the GPU work um, where we were using, um, you know, some people were putting together uh, a distributed shared memory server um, running across multiple cores with GPUs doing some kind of, um, so either some kind of uh, radar signature cross-section or doing some kind of uh, like n body calculation, um, and that was updating distributed shared memory. And we were, so we were doing, you know, um, GPU calculations and runtime visualization on a running code uh, all through XDMF. And it was like, wow! I, you're, just like you said, I can't cannot believe that actually worked. So they were actually passing data between the simulation code and the uh, visualization code by using the in memory file mapping chain. Yes, that, that's exactly how it, uh, it was working. Um, it was written in CUDA, and the uh, you know the uh, each of the GPUs would they would they would do that every they would do their calculation uh, every iteration. They'd update the positions or wh whatever information inside the distributed shared memory system. So the visualization w w was turned out to be really nice. You know, is the visualization could run at it, uh, its own pace and just take a snapshot of whenever it got to it, and it didn't hold up any of the uh, GPU processing. There really had to be no handshaking. Uh, going on, it was just writing out the shared memory, and the visualization system could pick it up whenever it got around to it. So it really helped decouple some of these things, which opened up our eyes to, you know, potentially doing that um, in a lot of different uh, coupling situations for coupling uh, different kind of codes from different disciplines, having them, you know, run at their own speed. As long as you got the RAM. Exactly. <laughs> So what kind of you mentioned a little while ago that uh, you're doing a new implementation? Is that just uh, a new evolutionary version, or maybe even a, a major dot release, or is this actually you you started uh, Blue Sky and uh, taking all the things that you've learned and, and started over? And what kind of features are coming in this? Um, uh, like I said, it, it's it's a uh, it's it's a new version. Um, it, it's uh, 
the, the old the older version was getting a little long in the tooth, and uh, some of the you know some of the more modern things like smart pointers were you know weren't in there. Um, so no, it's, I, I wouldn't say it's a it's a blue sky. Um, the, the main focus of it is to uh, clean up some of those things. Uh, you know, use smart pointers to to handle all the ownership issues. Um, make things just a, a little more abstract and easier to use uh, in parallel. So you know, implementing visitor patterns and, and, and things like that. And probably the the biggest part of it was to be able to use it as a uh, internal element database for uh, some of the uh, HPC codes. Uh, we're we're developing. Um, we're doing. Uh, we're getting into a lot of work in uh, multi-scale, um, multi-scale type applications, uh, and the, we we we'd like a way to have the internal uh, representation uh, of the data that's uh, internal to the code and the computation uh, closely reflect what's out there on disk and not have to move things around uh, and reorder reorder a lot of data. So um, that was the the real motivation uh, to doing that. So what's the uh, website and where we can get information, XDMF, mailing list, et cetera? So you can get everything at uh, www.xdmf.org. Uh, all the information you need on how to get it and how to get on the mailing list and all uh, should be right there. Um, so that should uh, be a pretty good start for it. And uh, a, lot of, a lot of interesting questions on the, on the mail list and a lot, of the, a lot of things get answered and a lot of uh, interesting applications are out there as well. Okay, well, Jerry, thank you very much for your time, and this show will be out soon, so thank you. Okay, thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Rob. Appreciate your time. Thanks.